rather a wet, uh, windy and horrible day. Um, have any of you managed to convince your whippets <laughs> to go out in the rain? I actually managed to convince one of mine. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so today I am here talking about uh, confidence building for nervous or reactive dogs. So these might be dogs who are a bit shy, uh, they get worried quite easily, um, or they might be, you know, react to new things. I'm going to be doing, talking a little, a few different things. I'm going to be talking about how we can rebuild their confidence, how to handle day-to-day -day life with them, um, and you know, good good things we can do with them to help to boost that confidence. Um, I'm absolutely freezing <laughs> as I've just got back from a walk in the rain with Arkle, my puppy. Um, apparently, he loves the rain. Um, please let me know if I have a really odd whip it. <laughs> I didn't expect him to. It's a long story. Um, I kind of got him dressed up like we were going to go for a walk to show him the, re the weather and then went expecting him to not want to go. He went, yeah, let's go. So we had to go for a walk in the rain. Um, he's having a great time. He's had a good time, but I am freezing. Um, so yeah, we have obviously done a lot of good things with Arkel because there was a time that he was terrified of the rain. And today he ran around in it. He splashed in puddles. I did all sorts of maniac sort of things um, for a whippet, in my opinion. Um, so today we're talking confidence building for nervous or reactive dogs. You know, we want to help these dogs uh, learn to handle life a little better. Um, if you have any questions um, to start with, you're welcome to pop them in the chat box um, or wherever you type it. I don't know. Um, you're welcome to ask questions um, now or as you go along and I'll grab your questions and answer them. So if you have any specific questions, do go ahead and ask. Um, I'm more than happy to answer them. All of my classes have been rained off today, so I won't be online quite a lot. Um, because it's either that or constantly entertain a puppy and I think he needs some level of sleep. So. If we have a nervous dog um, or a nervous puppy, um, it's one of the really important things that we need to do is we need to stop putting them in situations they're not yet able to handle. Um, and that's one of the like, key points. So I have, I have three whippets at the minute and I have had another whippet in the past. Um, Marley, who's in that photo, um, is one of, he was my first whippet, he is my first whippet. Um, and Arkel are very nervous dogs by nature. They're very worried. <laughs> They think life's out to get them. I kind of, with our call, we sort of joke when he sees something new, he's like, this is how I'm gonna die. This is how I'm gonna die. That's like his reaction, or used to be his reaction to new things. Just, he is a pessimist and he assumes the worst. So I'm very, very experienced with nervous dogs and reactive dogs because we've lived it <laughs> for 10 years with Marley. Um, so we wanna, first of all, stop putting them in situations like they're not yet equipped to handle. So if you're seeing on your walks or, you know, when you have visitors or whatever the context might be, if your dog is telling you they can't handle it at the minute, you need to start rethinking about that situation. Is it helping them constantly doing that thing? It probably isn't. Uh, you know, you'll probably be told if they, if they do something they're worried about enough times, they'll get used to it and they'll be absolutely fine. Um, you know, uh, a lot of my um, in-person clients get told this a lot when it comes to things like puppy play, like off-lead things. And they're like, oh, well, your puppy was terrified today, but if you come another three or four times, they'll get used to it. Um, that's not always a good option because they're not likely to form the associations you want them to. They might get more fearful. Um, they might be okay in that context. No, this pocket has poo bags, Arkle. You don't want those. Um, it's, it's probably not going to go the way you plan. Just... Continually putting your dog in a situation they're telling you they can't handle isn't going to help them. It's not going to benefit them in the long run. If they're, if they're panicking, you know, if they're not able to take food, if they're not able to engage with you, then they're not coping. And the reason that we really have to think about this carefully is because if you keep putting your dog in situations they can't handle and they keep getting anxious, um, let's say they pull on a lead out of anxiety, let's say they try and run home, you know, whatever it might be, tell me if you, you know, have any comments on what it is your dog does. Um, whatever it might be, if they do it, you know, and, it, and, it, and it's working for them, which it is, because they feel like it's helping them, they're going to be more likely to do it again. And this means that you've got a behaviour that starts to become a habit as well as a behavioural response. You start to get a dog who 
start to associate new situations um, or you know the situations they can't handle with panic and anxiety and that's not what you're looking for I'm assuming <laughs> it's not what I'm looking for it's not what you're looking for if we keep putting them in situations they can't handle and they keep displaying anxiety and they keep displaying let's say reactivity whatever it might be on that spectrum they're gonna keep doing it they're gonna get better at doing it too it's gonna start to become like a, a first response rather than a last resort in a lot of cases so you know sometimes people say to me my dog started panicking let's say for the sake of this discussion about the sight of men and if we start ignoring that um, and we don't deal with it and, and we keep putting them in that situation our dogs uh, ability to handle new things might be that they start to become scared so they might start to see uh, women and start to be scared they might also start to see um, novel items and start to be scared maybe dogs start to slip into that spiral because they're having constant st uh, or regular stress responses and it becomes a habit for them so we really don't want to keep putting them in these situations they can't handle it's not benefiting them it's not benefiting you because you don't want to see your dog stressed uh, I, I'm pretty sure you don't want to see your dog stressed or you wouldn't be watching. <laughs> um, so, and this kind of like apply to anything, you know, Arkel, um, he's my six months, six and a half month old puppy. When I got him, he was utterly terrified of everything. He seems to have a few like random scars on him from puppyhood, which is a bit odd, but he, he's a very nervous puppy. Um, he didn't like walks. Um, he made it really clear really early. He didn't like walks because where I live, there is a heavy amount of traffic um, and he was very scared of cars, really scared of cars. Now, old fashioned thinking would be you walk the puppy every day until they learn to handle it. But that's not very helpful because he was learning the outside world was quite scary. In fact, he was never he was never learning to handle traffic. He was getting more scared about that and everything else that was going on. So we just didn't walk every day at least not where there was heavy traffic we'd go for a walks up and down our quiet little road um, we would do lots of confidence building games that i'm going to talk about in a minute um, we would do lots of fun things so he started to see the world as fun because if i took him out every day on a walk where he was telling me he couldn't handle it not only is he rehearsing being panicked being panic stricken as a response which i really wouldn't like a puppy to learn about new things but he's learning I put him in these situations. Uh, he's saying to me, I can't handle it. I'm really worried about this. I, I don't know how to handle it yet. And I go, well, we're doing it anyway. And we do that every day. He's not going to trust me, which is actually going to make him more anxious. Because then when he is anxious or reactive, he feels he, owned, he has only himself to back himself up which means he could escalate his behaviours. I would always rather my dogs know I've got their back. I would always rather my dogs know that I'm there for them um, and I'm not going to put them in situations that they are not yet equipped to handle. So if, you know, if you're having struggles every day on your walks, think about changing your walks, think about the time of your walks, think about whether your dog actually needs a walk that day, a walk in that sense, because it's something that's embedded into us and it's all about quality, not quantity. Sorry for those of you that are bored of me saying that, but it really is. It makes all the difference. Arkel now goes for a walk nearly every day, absolutely fine in the world outside. He's absolutely fine, but this has taken a few months build up, but he's now probably one of the more stable, confident uh, teenage pups I know or have come across before because they've not, not overwhelmed him um, and I've not pushed him and I've not allowed him to rehearse a lot of things I don't want to see. So what, if, what have I done with Arkel and what do I recommend doing if you have a dog or a puppy who like lacks confidence or, or they are reactive? Because reactivity usually stems from a lack of confidence, you know. A lot of dogs who are reactive are usually doing so because they're really scared. So what would I recommend? Well, we want to build resilience and we want to build optimism. Uh, these are two key skills that are going to make sure that when your dog is faced with a new situation, they don't rehearse that fear that you know we're not letting them rehearse instead it could be an opportunity for good things we want them to see the world as an opportunity for good things so we want to build resilience and there are loads of like there are hundreds of ways we can do this um i could literally spend probably about three hours talking about the hundreds of things i've done with my dogs to build their resilience but i'm gonna try and keep it short and sweet um because while it's a rainy day, I'm sure you all have other things to do. <laughs> um, so what do we want to do? By, by resilience, I'm sort of meaning and optimism that my dogs do something new and they realize, yes, it could be a challenge, but I can overcome it. 
and it's a good thing. It's not a negative. It might be that we uh, create resilience based uh, around a positive association with food or toys or play. It's always sort of telling our dogs that new things equal a positive outcome. It's not a negative outcome. And some people say to me, um, you know, I have to put my dog in a situation that they're scared of the thing to help them with that thing. But confidence is a, is a general, a, a general feeling. Um, confidence isn't something we have to do in that stressful situation because if we do when it goes wrong we're going to knock that confidence we want to build that confidence up we want to build that optimism we want to build that resilience so we want to create loads of easy wins number one tip we want to create loads of easy wins so a dog who's worried might be easily worried by by training um, they might be dogs who struggle with pressure uh, whippets can be dogs who struggle with pressure by nature anyway and that if we make it too hard they kind of sh sometimes shut down or get easily frustrated um, so you want to create loads of easy wins with lots of easy games they can easily <laughs> complete um, and do them regularly if your if your dog has games that they love play those games play them regularly um, you know let them for a while just know that they're doing the right thing and that they they do they can make good choices that result in good outcomes that might be that, you know, for your dog, maybe that's just a sit. Maybe they just really love a sit and they're really happy doing a sit. And you do loads of fun, happy sits. Um, as an example, Arkel, oh, his favourite behaviour in the world is spinning. Spinning in a circle on cue. Um, he absolutely adores this behaviour. It gets him very, very excited. So we do lots of spins. We do lots of spins. We do lots of uh, hand touches. We do lots of toy play. We do lots of the things that he loves because I want him to, you know, associate me with fun. I want him to associate training with fun because I'm going to be doing training with him to boost his confidence. I want him to see the whole picture as a good thing. And the good thing about having behaviours that, you know, they love, you know, these behaviours that they really enjoy is you can later on start to incorporate them into the situations your dog might struggle with. So um, we were out, uh, we were out on a walk on a field the other day um, and there were, um, I don't know what they were, they were like vans and all sorts, so some sort of maintenance work going on the field. It was one of those vans that makes a lot of beeping noises as it's moving. When he was younger, he would have found that utterly terrifying and wanted to pull home. Now, he didn't find it utterly terrifying, but he certainly noticed it when we were doing some training games already. So rather than like continually persist with the more challenging things we were trying to do, we were trying to do like an emergency stop and down, he stopped being able to do that. So we reverted back to fun behaviours. We started doing some spins, we started doing some middles where he stands between my legs and suddenly his energy went up again because he associates these games with fun. So he has these, you know, little easy wins and he knows he can do them and he knows he can do them, which means doing them around a distracting thing is a lot easier and it makes the distracting worrying thing less worrying because it becomes associated with the fun behaviors, if that makes sense. Uh, so we're gonna do easy wins with training. Um, what else can we do to boost their confidence? Uh, the biggest thing we want them to do is feel confident about novelty and changes in their environment. The biggest thing that we, you know, you tend to find with a nervous dog is that they are worried about the things that are going on around them. They are worried about like, oh my god, you know, this man appeared, or oh my god, a jogger appeared, or oh my god, you know, a, a dog came out of its front garden completely unexpectedly. Um, so what we want to do is get them used to the idea that changes in their environment happen, novelty happens, and it results in a good thing. Easiest, easiest, honestly, the easiest way to do this, and it's so easy, people will look at me and think I've gone insane <laughs> when I suggest it, like, in one-to-one, -one, so like, but that's so simple. <laughs> yes. And the easiest way to do it is to feed your dogs um, from novel items. So, you know, your dogs eat every day. Your dogs have their dry food or their raw food or whatever it might be. Um, you know, whatever you're feeding them, they're eating every day. They are consuming food. Food is something that most dogs enjoy. If they're not food motivated, that's probably a, a, a different discussion for another day. Um, if they're not, you know, eating much food at home, that probably needs to be something we talk about separately. But your dog eats every day. The easiest way to get them happy about novel things is to feed them from novel things. Um, and it doesn't have to be scary novel things. So if I'm starting off with a really nervous dog, um, you know, which I have done quite a lot in the, in the last six to 12 months, um, just changing the, the type of food bowl is enough of novelty. So changing from a metal dish to a plastic dish or a ceramic dish or to a paper plate. This is like overly simplistic, it sounds, but it really is that simple because we want them to understand that 
Novel things still result in a good outcome without overfacing them, without making it too challenging. And for some dogs, simply changing their food bowl is enough to make them, you know, without, is enough for it to be helpful without it being too challenging. Whereas for some dogs, that's really easy. Some dogs, they've not noticed that their food has come off a different dish or a different plate. And for those dogs, there are hundreds of things. You literally walk around your house, you can find other things that you could feed your dog out of. Um, she says looking around, cardboard box, chuck some food in it, your dog's gonna put their face in it. If it's just, you know, an opened cardboard box, put their face in it with the, you know, you're gonna put the dry food in the cardboard box, they're gonna have to put their face in, find the food. That didn't take you any extra effort to find that cardboard box. If you're anything like me, you know, you've taken up shopping online quite extensively over the last 18 months. Yes, he's in his pyjamas. He's still slightly cold from his walk. Um, I just realised he appeared and looked ridiculous. Um, he thinks he looks good, but they're Marley's pyjamas. They're a bit big. <laughs> um, going off on a tangent again. Uh, so yeah, cover box. Had it in the house anyway. Right, well, you know, chuck some food in it. I can have the cover box in different ways. I could have the cover box upside down so they've got to knock it over to get the food. I could have the cardboard box open so it's like a tunnel and maybe they have to go slightly in the tunnel or a few cardboard boxes to get the food out. That's challenging for a nervous dog. It might not be scary for them in the house, you know, don't eat that, I'm trying to eat tags now. Um, <laughs> it might not be scary in the moment for that dog but that's the point. That's the exact point is we're building up loads of positive associations with novelty in an environment that our dogs can cope with. So we've got this bank of good experiences, so if they have to take out of the bank with a negative one, it's not as much of a big deal later. So, keeping an eye on him, it's up to no good. Uh, so we want to be, you know, feeding from novel items. Carver boxes is one thing, uh, you know, plastic bottles, put your dry food in a plastic bottle. If you're feeding raw food, which, you know, I know uh, some of you do, we've done a lot of this with Arkel when he was on raw a dish, a metal dish in a bigger metal dish is going to create some clanking, a metal dish in a cardboard box is still going to create clanking, um, you know, you can really play around, we discovered, with dishes as much as you like. Please don't eat your bed. Um, it doesn't have to be like those kind of items, it could literally be anything. I have been using, feeding them on their uh, platforms, um, I've been feeding them off like uh, spare boxes, like uh, under bed drawers and stuff. It doesn't have to be like a dog specific item. Puzzle toys are great, but puzzle toys like cost, cost money and they add up, right? They're great for a few times a week, but I would be, I would be eternally skint if I kept buying them. And I'm trying to stop, <laughs> stop myself buying stuff, right? Um, so it could be novel items. It could be whatever you think of. You could be as creative as you like. I've, you know, I've had some customers do some really creative, really good stuff. Um, and it can be at their meal times or it can be out like throughout the day to boost their confidence. Um, and it could be, I, mean, I would really, really recommend doing it in different parts of the house too, to build it like a generalization of this boosting of confidence too. I think that's something that is often missed is that we just do it in one part of the house. Whereas if there is a part of the house that maybe they struggle or they are reactive to sounds or they're anxious about noises, I would start in another part of the house where they're confident and start to bring those feeding games into that um, area of the house that they find more difficult, if that makes sense, or have the back door open if they're nervous about a dog barking, for example. Um, they can hear the dog, but then they're not right near the dog, if that makes sense. Um, so we want to feed from novel items, we want to introduce novelty, it doesn't have to be big and exciting, you know, I've said before, if you have kids, you've probably got like the most obscure items um, possible that you could, you know, obviously not toys that your kids like <laughs> or use regularly when they've had enough you know I, I regularly go charity shop hunting for like random objects to feed my dogs off of if you've been in any of my in-person classes or some of my online ones I've got my little kitty electronic keyboard um, and I'll feed them off that I'll get them playing with that it doesn't have to be anything exciting you know I'm looking around the room I've got a Halloween trick-or-treat bucket yeah they can have their food out of that um, and it could be plant pots upturned, plant pots in a, you know, uh, a washing up bowl, a washing up bowl. Again, not things you use. I would probably just, you know, a washing up bowl is about a quid from Pound Stretcher. From, from the last time I went, anyway. Who knows these days. Um, but, you know, it doesn't have to be anything dog specific. It just can be general. And those nice, fun, new, novel experiences are going to add up and help boost their confidence. Because every day, and also if I had a really nervous dog, I would almost do as many meals as possible, if not all, from something slightly different. 
um, because that's twice a day, over a week, what, that's 14, 14 opportunities if they're having two meals a day um, to boost their confidence. That's 14 opportunities over a month. I can't even do that maths and I really should be able to. Um, 14 by 13, no, not even gonna try. Feel free to let me know in the comments um, if you could do that maths for me. Um, but that's a lot of good experiences just in your home and just from their meals. You've not really done anything extra with your day because I know time is something we, we don't have a lot of as, as humans a lot of the time doesn't take you any extra time. So we've got creating easy wins, we've got um, feeding for novel items, I've kind of already covered this, playing fun training games I put in with easy wins. Um, you know, playing fun training games is really helpful. Um, as I said, I think it's one of the most important things that gets like, always gets knocked down like by some trainers, I think. They're like, oh, it's too exciting, they can't have that level of fun, it's gonna tip them over. It, it, training should be fun. Training should be exciting. Training should be something your dog enjoys. It's gonna boost their confidence, you know? So a lot of the dogs I know, once they start learning more behaviors and tricks, they actually are happier and more confident. Scientific reason is, it creates, the more your dog learns, the more your dog has new experiences that are good and they result in good outcomes, is it creates more uh, plasticity in the neural pathways in the brain, which basically means they go from being really rigid and like scary, everything's worrying, could kill me, to starting to be more pliable to the idea that good things can happen, where they're literally changing their brain ways doing stuff like this. So there's some simple ways, there's some simple ways. What else can we do? I mean, I could literally, I said to you earlier, talk for hours, I promise I won't. I promise I'm coming, coming to, uh, to an end on this. Um, what else can we do? So I think where we've got a nervous dog and perhaps they've got a specific fear or a reactive dog and it's a specific uh, reactivity, maybe it's the bath they're scared of. Maybe it's um, getting brushed they don't like, uh, you know, it worries them. Maybe, you know, they don't like other dogs and they react to them. Whatever it is, I think sometimes we oversimplify things as humans. And I've definitely been guilty of this myself. Sometimes we just go, right, I need to get you happier with the bath. I'm going to take you in the bath, going to give you a licky mat, that'll get you used to it. Has anyone tried that? I don't know a lot of women <laughs> who that works hugely successfully with great to those that do, but I know a lot of dogs who will quickly learn that the licking mat means bath time and I don't like baths. Um, so, you know, if I talk about the example of a bath, because I've done a lot of work on this with um, with Arthur, my last dog, talking too fast, aren't I? Slow down. <laughs> um, we talk about baths, for example. There's actually a lot of like, and this is the same for anything, I'm going to talk about baths, but it's literally the same for any behaviour that your dog displays when they're anxious, any certain trigger. But I'm going to talk about baths because it's easier to uh, in my brain to explain. If I want my dog who's scared of the bath to get used to bath, there is quite a, a you know, a lot of triggers, li mini triggers, I'm going to call them mini triggers to the bath. The bath is a process he doesn't like, right? Let's say it's a bath. Your dog's nervous of the bath, you don't like the bath. That's not it though, because there's all these tiny little mini triggers that I actually don't like. Maybe they don't like the running water. Maybe they don't like the actual bathtub. Maybe they no longer like the bathroom. Maybe they are uh, scared of, you know, the, like if you've got a fan or something in that room. Maybe there's a lot of other triggers going on here. Maybe it's just not, not just water. Maybe it's running water. Maybe it's still water. Maybe you can see these little bits start to build up into this bigger scenario. So when I was getting used, to, uh, Arthur used to having a bath, what I would do is I have some videos. I didn't get to complete them all as unfortunately he got very ill when I was trying to, um, film this pretty, uh, you know, these steps to show you what I mean, but we started off like by totally taking the picture apart. The picture is, it, he's in a bathtub. When you pull it apart, it's water, it, you know, it's all of these things. So in the kitchen, I would get a, a spare washing up bowl and fill it with empty water and give him a con. He just had to eat his con around it. I would then build up to having the shower head in to, from like the kitchen taps into this um, uh, bucket of uh, washing up bowl that's not aimed at uh, Arthur with running water while he had his Kong. Um, so he was getting good associations with a few of the steps of the bath without having a bath. While we were working on this training, what were we doing? We were going into the bathroom and playing training games. We weren't always going for a bath. We were playing tuggy, we were playing find it, we were playing tricks that he liked and we were leaving. Sometimes he was having his meals in there. Sometimes I would pick him up, pop him in the bath, give him like a few high value treats, take him out of the bath. We were doing loads of things, like surrounding this bigger picture, these little mini triggers. We were doing a lot of work on these mini triggers 
not just going in the bath you will get used to it or in the bath here's some food while there's running water on you because that's too late <laughs> the picture is too too big and these mini triggers need to be addressed if that makes sense maybe it doesn't but i think it does <laughs> it does make sense um so we we worked on loads of separate things and then we would gradually put each part of the puzzle together so what if you got used to the running water in the kitchen um, and being okay with it and he was okay with the bathroom then he would come into the bathroom and I'd run the taps or run the shower head or whatever I was doing and we do our training games it wasn't pressure onto him and we would quit and then sometimes we would go in the bath um he would go in the bath and he would be um given some food and I would have like the kitchen um sorry not the kitchen the the, the sink with running water instead of the bath and feeding and feeding him and feeding him or giving his Kong or licky mat um and it wasn't a pressure on him and we got to the point where he was able to go in the bath have his you know shower head running over him having a bath out the bath done this took a lot of time to build up, no doubt, but it it was the right way to do things, or I could have spent the next 10 years trying to wrangle them into the back. Unfortunately, of course, I've not got much videos for you because we, we lost Arthur very shortly after due to ill health, um, but it, it, it's, it's achievable. But if I tried to keep achieving it in the way of, here is a big picture, have some food, you love it, <laughs> it's not gonna work. Instead, by tearing it apart and saying, there's loads of mini triggers here, let's work on those. So that was just the example of a bathtub. Maybe your dog's anxious on walks. Um, Arkle's a good example. On a walk, he would do what we call trigger stacking and struggle to cope because there were hundreds of mini triggers on his walks um, and things that he was anxious about. That was um, people with like trolleys, uh, strange noises, uh, big dogs, he's quite scared of big dogs. Um, it could have been like an ambulance siren. It could have been the, the sight of something completely new because he was still a puppy. And all of these little things, these little mini triggers, added up to him being very anxious, very, like to the out very spontaneously without much reason. But actually it's because the mini triggers needed addressing because the problem wasn't so much that he didn't like his walk the problem was more that we have to address these little parts so we pulled his walk apart <laughs> we started changing it we started going to different places i wanted him to enjoy walks we went to walks he enjoyed then sometimes we went out to places where there would only be let's say people and we did some people watching we'd go home before he got anxious so he couldn't rehearse the anxiety you know we do, we want to be sure that we're not just lumping things together we want to look at those mini triggers we want to look at those as well because we often as humans don't re like think of those we just say oh, my dog doesn't like walks my dog doesn't like baths my dog doesn't like other dogs and even other dogs is a big one because people will say to me but my dog's fine with this dog or my dog's fine with that dog but he's not fine with this dog and i don't understand why and it's because it's not always for some dogs just a dog how's that dog behaving is that dog offering a uh, play with a play bow or is that dog being uh, quite pushy and in your face is that dog under control on the lead or is that dog relaxed on the lead um is that dog a certain breed is it a certain uh, sex is it a certain size there's loads of little, little mini triggers because for example marley could cope with a small dog barking at him he kind of goes He's not a fan of barking, he's not a fan of dogs, he's not a fan of small dogs, but he's okay with all of them these days. However, if a big dog was barking at him, he would react back because he doesn't really like big dogs at all. He's quite scared of them. Um, so it's not so much that it's just dogs he's reactive to, it's these little things as well. So the little things are worth remembering. The little things are worth remembering because when you're describing a problem, like, you know, putting in simplicity, my dog doesn't like the harness being put on, my dog doesn't like um their coat being put on there's probably loads of reasons maybe they don't like their head going into something maybe they're anxious about touch maybe there's lots more going on that you don't see and the good thing is by by starting to recognize these things we can help them much easier it's so much easier when we recognize those mini triggers and we can help them Whew, so i've talked a lot <laughs> talked a lot not sure if I've been helpful. Uh, <laughs> I could talk for hours, but I really have to keep things a little tighter today. So I am going to wrap up in a moment. If you've got any questions, let me know. Literally, they can be anything. It can be dog specific. It could be your dog has a worry about certain things. Or what do you do when, you're, when your dog panics? Feel free to ask. Uh, and put, you know, pop those in the comments below. And I will address them. Um, but so far, we've talked about 
So scrolling up, stopping putting your dog in situations they can't handle just yet. They might be able to handle them someday. Hopefully they'll be able to handle them someday. But for now, abandon the things your dog hates um, because it's just making it harder for both of you. And they're rehearsing anxiety. They're rehearsing panic and that's gonna become a much more rehearsed response. And we don't want that, we don't want that at all. So we wanna build resilience, lots of easy wins. It could be through training games, that could be through introduction of novelty, that could be through, you know, even the smallest of challenges, like walking over some noisy poles on the floor. Uh, we want to play fun training games, are fun. We want to break down, uh, you know, triggers uh, to the mini triggers and work on those separately. Um, and I think, I think that's maybe it. I think that's maybe it for today. Um, I think that's everything I meant to talk about. Again, you can pop some comments in the thing, uh, I always say below, but I think it depends what device you're on. It could be at the side, it could be anywhere. Um, feel free to comment. If you're watching this later, feel free to comment. You don't have to ask, um, it, just because you're not watching live doesn't mean you can't ask questions. I'll still come back and I'll still come to this later and have a read. What I'm hoping is that by the end of the weekend, I'm gonna have a full uh, list, uh, class list, online class list uh, for uh, Whip It Wonders. Um, so you know already, I do online uh, classes over Zoom. These are a great opportunity, especially when you look at, if you're in the UK, uh, in certain parts of the UK today, you look out the window. These are a great opportunity because your whippet doesn't have to leave the house. And um, they can stay indoors and they don't have to battle the weather. I've got puppy courses coming recall courses and a confidence building course. Um, all courses are only at like four places, so you're always getting lots of attention live. Um, it will be on Zoom rather than something like this, so you can talk back and I can watch your dogs. Um, and, and it's just a great opportunity. Do it from home, do it from the comfort of your home. Look comfortable with it. My, mine's curled up in his bed <laughs> in his pajamas right now. Um, he would show you some stuff if he wants, but if I wanted to, but I think I'm gonna leave him to sleep. He's quite cold, <laughs> I think still. Um, but I will be um, making a little bit of a, a class list and I'm hoping that'll be done by the week, uh, by the end of the weekend, because I've got a little extra time today. Uh, Suzanne said, it's really helpful. We'll need to think about breaking down grooming with Stitch, especially brushing as he doesn't like it. Uh, I know definitely, if you're still around um, later, if, for those of you that will be, um, uh, on Wagon Wonders, I'm doing a thing on stationing uh, for cooperative grooming and breaking that down. Um, it's my, I'm going to show you my favourite technique and I'm going to try and have Arkola wait for it. Because he's never done anything like that. You can always see the picture from the start. Um, but Marley, Marley hates like any sort of um, physical handling um, because of, of, you know, the not so great training I did with him when he was much younger, about 10 years ago. So we do a lot of things like that. And again, it's, it's exactly like, it's almost exactly, I think if you train cooperative grooming quite a lot, um, it, it helps you look at trigger pictures a little bit better because it's about breaking down into these little things. Um, but yeah, if, if any of you are around later, it's at 1 p.m. So it's in about half an hour. Um, I will be on Wagging Windows talking co uh, using stationing for cooperative grooming. So if you have a dog who doesn't like brushing, you have a dog who e even doesn't like the harness being put on. The technique I'm gonna show you, I've used with loads of different issues and it's way easier than you would think to teach. You don't need lots of super skills to teach this. Um, so if you're, if you're interested, that is on the Wagon Wonders page, which um, you should find somewhere. So I'll pop it in the group, um, if you're in the Whippet Wonders group. Um, but otherwise, um, I'm gonna have to let you all go. I will let you know with that class list later. If you have any questions, give me a shout. But otherwise, I am gonna, I am gonna learn and I need to learn to be more patient. I'm not a very patient person by nature, um, so I totally get where you're coming from. I'm totally not patient. Um, but my dogs are making me more patient every day. <laughs> but that's completely another story, which I won't go into um, because I'm just wittering now. But um, I will see some of you in about half an hour. Um, but otherwise, if you have any questions, give me a shout, but enjoy the rest of your weekend. If not, and I will uh, be posting in the group anyway at some point. Thanks for joining, bye.